All right, thank you for joining me on this episode of the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marlon Wilson, and we have another great show for you today. Another fantastic debate. If you watched last time I was on, we uh, had an interview. So we are back on the debate stage tonight, and I have Ricky Caldwell and Stanley Terry with me, and we're going to be talking about the Sabbath, man. Is, sa- is it necessary to, if you keep the Sabbath, is that what gets you into heaven? Is that what keeps your salvation by observing the Sabbath, by keeping the Sabbath? Is that necessary? to inherit the kingdom of God and that's what we're going to be debating today but before I bring these guys in I do want to encourage you to make sure you're hitting that notification bell and that subscribe button so you can stay in the loop what the God's truth has going on you don't miss out on anything that's the God's truth has going on also if you didn't know the video content is not on every platform but certainly the gospel truth is it's on Facebook Twitter and Instagram so make sure you are flown over to these other platforms to subscribe and follow and like on all those other platforms platforms as well also if you're a big fan of the podcast all this content is added to podcast try to get it every week sometimes i fall and i I fall off and i don't get there to every two weeks but nonetheless the podcast is being updated as much as possible to make sure you have that option for you all right and as always i do have several shows that are coming up here in the future that i want you to be aware of all right i have david wilson david wilson and matt nickel have unbelievers been crucified and raised in christ that's coming up soon so make sure you are looking to stay on the lookout for that one after that are the marian dogmas reasonable to believe of michael harrington steve christie make sure you are hitting that notification bell so you don't miss out on this debate uh, after that, did Jesus substitute himself for every person? Tyler Vila, Kevin, uh, Kevlar Henderson is going to be jumping on. So make sure you're looking out for that one. And then finally, is Jesus the Father and the Holy Spirit? Trinitarian, oneness, great debate coming up. So make sure you are flooring here, man, to make sure you're seeing all these debates. You don't want to miss out on any of these debates because if you miss out on any debates, you miss out on some great content, man. Don't uh, don't miss out on it. Anyway, um, so you, you guys are familiar with these guys. These guys have jumped uh, jumped in the gospel truth ring octagon before. I have uh, Ricky Caldwell and Stanley Terry. Um, for whatever reason, I did not pull the debate 
in the suitable topic they debated last time perhaps they can remind you but nonetheless it was a great debate a very uh, energized debate uh, you know sometimes the debates man sometimes the claws show and the teeth grin at each other grind at each other you know I, th I think we got a little bit of that last time these two debated but it was a fun friendly debate overall though and i think the content was great so i'm glad to have these guys back to be able to jump into the ring and tangle some theology once again and so and let me bring these guys in so they can further introduce themselves to you guys how y'all doing fellas Thank you very much for the hospitality, man, uh, Marlon. Oh, no doubt, man, no doubt. You guys were great last time, man. So when you guys uh, hit me up, man, you want to do it again, man, it was definitely a no-brainer to bring you guys back on, man, because uh, you guys did handle yourself professionally, and you guys interacted well. So that's uh, one of the great things about debates, man. You get two interlocutors who can uh, handle themselves and respect each other and show a little teeth, man, you know, because you guys are passionate about what you believe. When you guys can do that and the level of respect you guys did it, it's always warm and, and, and welcoming to have you guys back. So I'm glad to have you back so we're gonna jump into this and so what i want to do first is obviously i want you guys to introduce yourselves tell them what you do tell them your blogs websites whatever you do man let them know what you do out there so start with rick man go ahead and give a, a quick introduction to yourself man well thank you marla uh thank you for having me on for this uh wonderful occasion this wonderful topic uh, my name is rick caldwell and i actually have a youtube channel called caldwell apologetics where i talk all things theology I uh, kind of borrowed that from my other friend, Chris. I hope you I hope you don't mind. But I do talk about theology. I talk about thinking logically. I talk about expositional teaching uh, and how we apply that to practical matters in our lives. So if you're interested in that type of content, go into your YouTube, type in uh, Caldwell Apologetics. And by the way, Marlon, the topic was uh, in our last debate is was Jesus, is Jesus truly God and truly man? during his earthly ministry. That was the debate ah, topic uh, okay, that Stanley okay. and I covered last time. So thanks for having me on. All right, thank you for coming back, man. I appreciate you, Rick. All right, Mr. Stanley, go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Thank you very much. My name is Stanley Terry. I have, let me see if I'm, okay, yeah. So my name is Stanley Terry. I have a channel called Your Way or Yahweh Tested by Fire. And our uh, mandate is estimated in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy every argument at uh, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So uh, we're going to be debating, uh, is Sabbath keeping necessary to inherit the kingdom? Not for salvation. Salvation is a whole different issue to inherit the kingdom. So I, um, once I present my, my case, uh, if you guys are more interested in an exhaustive uh, resource where I establish my case and explain uh, the importance of the Sabbath, as uh, in relation to sanctification and, and in relation to, um, um, oh yeah, to, in relation to sanctification and inheriting the kingdom, I would refer you to my video called um, The Sabbath Challenge, uh, The War in Heaven, and The Proof Jesus Will Save. And I will also uh, refer you to another uh, video called The Sabbath Challenge, uh, Doctor, so-called Dr. Joshua Bowen gets educated on the issue of so-called slavery. So those two videos will give you a more uh, exhaustive um, uh, uh, resource as it relates to this uh, topic that we're debating today. Thank you. All right, good stuff, guys. Thank you so much once again for joining me. And we're going to get into this debate. Once again, the topic is, is Sabbath keeping necessary to inherit the kingdom of God? Stanley, you're arguing the affirmative. Rick, you're arguing the negative. And so we're going to jump into this. We'll start with 10-minute opening statements. Then we're going to have five-minute rebuttals. And then we're going to go into a 40-minute cross X. Both of you will get 20 minutes uh, to cross X each other, ask a question, answer it as best as you can. Then we go jump into five minute closings and then we'll do some Q&A from the audience. As we discussed before, I uh, will show you grace in your opening and your your, your rebuttals. Uh, two minute grace, so uh, make sure you stay within that if you can. All right, uh, that said, uh, Stanley, you're up first. Um, All right, so soon, start my time as soon as I, I uh, give me a second. All right, so as soon as you see my screen, uh, you can start my time. Give me a second here. So, is it all right? Yep, it's up. All right, perfect. So we have an important topic to, to discuss today. And the question is, is Sabbath keeping necessary to inherit the kingdom? I hold the affirmative. Uh, let me see here. Yeah. Uh, 
something is wrong. Give me a second here. All right. Uh, why is this not working? Give me a second. I have to restart. All right, I'll, I'll, be, I'll pause your time. and. Okay. All right, no problem. Give me a second. All right. It was working before, right? And look at that. Yeah. On the screen. Home tab. All right, so now it works. So again, right. uh, we have an important, you could start my time, thank you. Uh, started at 826, okay. Uh, is Sabbath keeping necessary to inherit the kingdom? This is a very important topic, sort of to understand. Um, let me see here. Okay. All right, so point number one, in order to address this important issue, I'm I'm going to address, uh, I'm going to respond uh, to this important topic in four points. Number one, the Council of Jerusalem was specifically about God taking out the, out of the Gentiles a people for his name. So I'm going to be referring to Acts 15, verse 13 and 14. And it says, and they, uh, after they had held their peace, Jesus answered saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon had declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So notice that Acts 15, that's the Council of Jerusalem was specifically about uh, the Gentiles, a uh, people that God would call out uh, for his name. Point number two, James identifies the Gentiles to the tabernacle of David, which is being built again by appealing to the prophets. So consider Acts 15, verse 15 and 16, where it says, and to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, and this I will return, and I will build the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again in the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So notice that the Council of Jerusalem was about the Gentiles who are qualified as the tabernacle of David, as per the prophets. Number three, further clarification is given in relation to the tabernacle of David being identified as Gentiles upon whom the name of God is called. So consider Acts 15, verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called says Yahweh, who does all these things. Now, the end, the conjunction end can also mean uh, namely. So whether in, uh, the interpretation that you hold to uh, that it's and uh, referring to the same group of people or namely given, uh, I'm sorry, and as a separate distinct group of people or namely as uh, providing more information or uh, more description uh, uh, to who these people are. For example, that the residue of man might seek after the Lord, namely all the Gentiles who are called by his name. Either interpretation will not be problemat uh, problematic for my position. So let's go to point number This clearly stipulates how the Gentiles had become acquainted with the law of Moses and that they had been keeping the seven day Sabbath. Consider Acts 15, 21. For Moses of old had in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues Sabbath. That being established, let's consider uh, the prophets, because uh, James was referring to the prophets, right? So let us get a better understand, uh, understanding of what the prophet understood um, this uh, prophecy to, to relay, the message it was trying to relay. So um, let's consider Amos 9-11, and it says, on, and, and the Hebrew is from right to left, right? So on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages and its ruins, and I will raise up and rebuild it, as the days of old. So notice that Amos 9-11 is cross-referencing uh, what uh, James said in Acts 15. Let's read uh, the next verse. And it says, that they, who are, is this referring to? The Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David, that they may possess, and the word possess here is in inherit, as we'll see later on. So they, the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David, may possess, uh, inherit the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by his name, says Yahweh, who does these things. So notice that's the distinction between the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David as opposed to those Gentiles who will be inherited by them and who are called by his name. So how the tabernacle of David, which consists of Jews and Gentiles, will inherit 
from the Hebrew word Yarash, the remnant of Edom and the Gentiles who are called by his name. So we can see on the left, the word Yarash and one of the uh, 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 definition is inherit. So what are the distinguishing markers that delineate the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David from the Gentiles who will become their inheritance? So what are the distinguish, uh, dis distinguishing markers? So let's consider Amos 9, verse 8 and 9, two verses prior, to get a context so we can contextualize the meaning of what Amos 9, 11 means. Uh, so consider, behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful nature, uh, sin sinful king, king, kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says Yahweh. For lo, I will command and I will shift the house of Israel among all nations like a coin is shifted in a sheave, yet shall not a least of the grain fall upon the earth. So consider four points. Number one, they are acquainted with the law of Moses, as per Acts 15.21. They keep the Sabbath, the seven-day Sabbath, as per Acts 15, 21. They are called the house of Jacob, as per Amos 9, 8. And they are called the house of Israel, as per Amos 9. Now, let us parallel that with Isaiah 58, 12, since it will provide some further insight as it relates to this prophecy, since Amos 9, 11 is totally uh, 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 consistent or speaking of the same prophecy as Amos 9, 11, which is also cross-referenced with Acts 15, verse 13 to 21. Consider, and it said, and shall build those from among you. So notice now it went from God building to uh, the, gen, uh, the tabernacle of David, uh, the people who are part of the tabernacle of David, they're the one building now by spreading the, uh, the message. So again, it says, and shall build those from, uh, those from among you, the waste places uh, and the foundations of old and of many generations. And you shall raise up and you shall raise them up and shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of the streets to dwell in. So compare Amos 9.11 to Isaiah 58.12 and you will notice the six Hebrew words uh, 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 that are uh, uh, the same basically uh, being mentioned in both verses. So there should be no confusion that both verses are, are the same thing. So notice how Isaiah affirms Sabbath keeping as an identifying marker of those who are part of the tabernacle of David and stipulates how they will partake in the heritage of Jacob. My proof text will be Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. And if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then, conditional, shall thou delight in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So notice that the word heritage here is specifically the topic of discussion right now. Will a uh, Sabbath keep, keeping necessary for you to inherit the kingdom? And here we can see the word nakala is, des uh, uh, is defined as inheritance. So you need to keep this in order, in order for you to inherit uh, the promises of Jacob. So notice how my approach of so interpreting all the verses I have presented so far is wholly consistent with Isaiah 56, given the fact that the strangers who keep the Sabbath will be brought to his holy mountain since they will be incorporated in Israel. Consider Isaiah 56, verse 6 and, uh, to 8. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer and my house in my house of prayer and their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted upon my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Yahweh God, which gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, yet I will gather others to him besides those who are already gathered to him. So my challenge today to all Sabbath deniers, in order for my interlocutor to win this debate, he will have to explain, number one, why Gentiles who are incorporated in Israel would not be required to keep the Sabbath in light of the fact that scripture stipulates in Leviticus 24, 22, one standard of law for the native born and the stranger. Challenge number two, why he, uh, uh, why he argues 
against Sabbath keep, keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that they were becoming acquainted with the law of Moses as per Acts 15, 21. Number three, why he argues against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles and uh, Gentiles in light of the fact that there were in the synagogues every Sabbath as per Acts 15, 21. Number four, why he argues against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that Amos 9, 12 clearly stipulates the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David will inherit the Gentiles who are called by his name. Challenge number five, why he argues against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that Isaiah 58, 12 to 14 clearly stipulates that they will inherit the promises of Jacob. And finally, why he argues against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that Isaiah 56, verse six and eight, uh, verse six to eight, clearly stipulates the conditional basis by which one can be in covenant with Jesus and be brought to his holy mountain. So this is my presentation. And I'm, I'm hoping to see how uh, Ricky Codwell will be able to engage with that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, we'll see uh, what he has to, uh, to provide for us tonight. All right. Thank you, Stanley, for that. Appreciate it. All right, Ricky, you're up for your 10-minute opening statement. Uh, I'll start your time and you begin yeah. to speak. Yeah, let me go ahead and get the presentation pulled up. And once I start speaking, right. you can start the time. Got you. One, uh, the topic is Sabbath keeping necessary in order to inherit the kingdom of God. And I think it's going to be fundamental that we understand what the Sabbath is. I think definitions are important because uh, we, we don't have definitions. We're going to end up talking past one another. And so let's start with that. It's important to understand what the Sabbath is. So uh, the seven day Sabbath was the sign of the covenant, sign of the Mosaic covenant. Because of the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments were distinct covenant documents, a specific covenant sign accompanied them. So you can refer to Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 18, that teaches that the Sabbath was the sign of the covenant given at Sinai. It's so important that we understand that. Next, uh, there's a couple of facts that we want to look at about Exodus 31, verses 12 through 18. First, the Ten Commandments were synonymous with tablets of stone and the two uh, tablets of testimony. They were actual covenant documents that established Israel's special national status with God. Two, uh, two uh, tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Secondly, that the Sabbath or the fourth commandment was the sign of the covenant. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Third, the sign of the covenant or Sabbath stands for the whole covenant. To break the sign is to despise the entire covenant. Keep the Sabbath for a perpetual covenant. Fourth, the covenant was made only with the nation of Israel. That's so important. Only with the nation of Israel. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel. Fifth, the essence of the Sabbath covenant was to refrain from all physical work. It had nothing to do with public worship. That's so important in light of what we just heard in the opening. Um, Whosoever doeth any work, six days may work be done, but on the seven on, is the Sabbath of rest. Whosoever doeth any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So there's more evidence that the Sabbath was a covenant sign and its significance. You can consider Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 11 through, uh, 11 through 20. Uh, specifically, if you notice the connection on verses uh, 13 through 16, uh, uh, verses 13, 16 through 20, where Israel committed many grievous sins, but it was not until they profaned the Sabbath that they were put into captivity. Um, second point, Israel's Babylonian captivity was measured in terms of how many years they have refused to observe the Sabbath year law to let the land lie idle. It's Jeremiah 29, verses 10, and 2 Chronicles 36, 21. The fact that the judgment that consisted of captivity for 70 years, what for breaking the Sabbath year law, shows that all the Sabbaths were just as holy as the seventh day Sabbath. Paul makes this clear in Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, or 14 through 17. 
So let's examine the Sabbatarian's view of Colossians 2, verses 13 through 17. Can the passage sustain an only ceremonial Sabbath interpretation, or does it clearly include the seventh-day Sabbath with those done away under the new covenant? That's important that we understand we're not under the old covenant, we're under the new covenant. Verses 13 makes it clear that the apostles is talking about regeneration and salvation. You have he quickened. God made you alive with Christ. Verse 14 shows that forgiveness of sins and salvation came only because the handwritten ordinances that were against us, which were contrary to us, had been taken away out of the way by being nailed to the cross. The law that was nailed to the cross is the same law that stood between God and us. The handwritten ordinances in these verses can only be a description of the tablets of testimony referring to Exodus chapter 31 verses 18 and chapter 34 verses 27 through 29 or the Ten Commandments. They are the tablets of testimony because as the terms of the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments were written on tablets. They testify against sin and rebellion. The so-called ceremonial law could not be called the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Removal of the ceremonial law is not the ground for a forgiveness and acceptance with God. This passage context, again, is salvation through the atonement of Christ. It is not discussing freedom from the ceremonial laws. If this passage is reduced to refer to merely ceremonial laws, then our blessed Lord shed his blood just as so people could eat bacon with eggs and be free from all the Jewish ceremonial feasts. That would be a distorted view of both the atonement and the great gospel liberty that it purchased. Paul expected his readers to know exactly what he meant by Sabbath. In fact, Leviticus 23 is the only place in all of Scripture that presents a complete list of God's Sabbaths. We will let God's word itself tell us what Paul refers to by the word the Sabbath days in Colossians 2.16. And the Lord spake again unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to, what? Be holy convocations, underline, and even these are my feast. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Question, what's the very first feast or holy convocation on the list of ceremonial Sabbaths? Answer, the seventh-day Sabbath set forth in the fourth commandment. That's such a critical point here. As the Lord thy God commanded thee, so referring to Numbers chapter 5, verse 12, does not refer to a creation ordinance. Can't, cannot possibly refer back to creation because Adam was never delivered from the bondage of Egypt. And that's the context there if you look at verse 15 in Numbers 5. It refers back to Exodus 20, verse 8, since God gave the commandment to Israel at Sinai after deliverance from Egypt. God did not command Adam to keep the Sabbath, but he did at Mount Sinai command Israel to keep the Sabbath as a sign of the covenant that he just made with them. Deuteronomy 5, 15 does not even mention God resting at creation. It specifically gives redemption from Egypt as the reason that Israel was to remember the Sabbath. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Isaiah 56 verses 1 through 6 points to the fulfillment in Christ, not the Mosaic law. Yes, it starts in the beginning with verse 1 about the hope and the encouragement during the post-exilic period after the Babylonian captivity because the later part of Isaiah deals with the restoration of the children of Israel for my salvation is near to come. Blessed is the one who keeps the law, the Mosaic law, specifically the covenant sign, the, the Sabbath. Yet remember... Colossians 2.16, we got to connect all of what scripture says. The breath of God's redemptive plan in, in the covenant community includes the stranger and the eunuch who were considered unclean, ultimately fulfilled in Christ Jesus, referring to John 11, verses 50 to 52, which says, and not for that nation only, but also Christ should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. As it refers to here in Isaiah 56, 8, the Lord God, which gathered the outcasts of Israel, uh, said, yet I will gather others to him beside those who are gathered unto him. Inheritance passages do not mention the Sabbath. That's such a critical point. 
Uh, and I'm referring mainly when I say that to the New Testament scriptures, because we are under the new covenant. Uh, and that's a critical point in reference to the kingdom of God. The admonition in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 makes no mention of the Sabbath. When the Apostle Paul contrasts the works of the flesh with the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, 21, there's no mention of the Sabbath. In regards to the truth of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, there is no mention of the Sabbath. In Ephesians 5, 5, also makes no mention of the Sabbath. We need the contrast between what covenant were the children of Israel under and what covenant are we under in Christ Jesus. The basis of any inheritance is God alone. We were born again from above by the work of the Holy Spirit, John 3, 3, 5, in order to see and enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, kingdom of the inner the kingdom. So this is a work of the spirit. When asked, what must I do to inherit, uh, inherit eternal life? And they heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible for men are possible for God. Inheritance, we obtain in accordance to God's eternal purpose in Christ. See Christ at work here and whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose in him. The grounds of inheritance is not the law, which we've heard stated earlier, that the, that the law is connected to inheritance, which would include the Sabbath, but the irrevocable promise of God. For, the inherit, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of the promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee or earnest of our inheritance. We only fit, we are only fit to be partakers of the inheritance because the Father had, what the Father has done, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. By God's abundant mercy, we have been born again to a living hope, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and faded not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And so, my friend, uh, I can recap this later, but bottom line, inheritance is directly related to salvation, as we just seen in Scripture. So I look forward to the rebuttal round as we continue this wonderful topic and discussion. All right, thank you so much for that, uh, Ricky. All right, uh, Stanley, you're back up. I don't see your camera, buddy. Uh, you want to pull yourself in? There you go. All right. So you got about, you got five minutes, also two minutes of grace there, uh, for your rebuttal. So you got it and I'll start your time. You begin to speak, uh, Stanley. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try to respond quickly to what he presented and I'm going to address the Colossians 2, 6, 7, 16 and 17, which people like to use, which I'm going to, I have something in my presentation that I should address that. So he said something about, um, if I have the time, basically, uh, he said, uh, the covenant, um, okay. So th there needs to be a distinction between the covenant, the 10 commandments and the, uh, rest of the law of Moses. Uh, so uh, Deuteronomy 5.22 makes it clear that the Ten Commandments, uh, he, uh, he is part of the covenant and he added nothing else to it. And you can also compare that, cross-reference that with 10, uh, Deuteronomy 10 verse 2. And making a clear distinction between that and Deuteronomy 31.26, which says uh, that uh, the rest of the law of Moses was a witness against us. So when he suggested that uh, uh, Paul was suggesting uh, that... Uh, uh, that uh, uh, he blotted out uh, the law that was against us. He's not referring about the Ten Commandments. He's referring to the law of Moses, the 613 laws, supposedly. So clear distinction between the covenant and, uh, um, and uh, uh, the rest of the laws. All right. So that's number one. And he said uh, the Sabbath is a sign with Israel. So if you're not Israel, then you're not a covenant with Jesus Christ. Jer Jeremiah 31, 31, you, you said the new covenant, but there's only two covenants, one with Judah and one with Israel. If you're not part of the congregation of Israel, you're not in covenant with Jesus Christ. Uh, and in the Old Testament, uh, strangers were called members of the congregation of Israel as per uh, ex Exodus 12, verse 18, 19, 48, and 49. So um, if you're saying, trying to suggest that Israel is sometimes, uh, is not, uh, doesn't encompass strangers who keep the, uh, the commands of God, then you're going against Moses because it's clearly stipulated in Exodus 12, verse 18, 19, 
um, 48 and 49, Isaiah 14, verse 1, uh, you would become incorporated inside of Israel. Um, Paul even himself uh, uh, makes that, uh, uh, clearly stipulates that in his scriptures. So that's number, so if again, so if you're suggesting that the sign is only with Israel and you're not part of Israel, then you're not in covenant with Jesus Christ because there is no covenant with Gentiles. So that's number two. And number three, you're under a new covenant. Yeah, Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, the covenant is with Judah and Israel. So if, you, if you're not part of Israel, I know you're not a Jew, so if you're not Israel, then you're not in covenant with Jesus Christ. Um, uh, also, you said the law that was against us is, uh, so the law that is against us is not the Ten Commandments, all right? So I want to make that clear that it's, um, it's, it's incumbent on Ricky Caldwell to establish that it is about the Ten Commandments, but that is contradictory to what Paul says when he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, uh, circumcision or uh, uncircumcision is nothing, talking about the law of Moses, but he says, but the keeping of the commandments of God. So he makes a clear distinction between the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments. So trying to use Paul and trying to uh, mis uh, and contradict the, uh, the, the, the word of Paul is, uh, is, um, is quite problematic for your position. Uh, he went to Colossians 2.16. I'm going to go at the end and respond to that by uh, presenting that my uh, uh, my presentation on that. He says, so um, uh, no mention of the Sabbath in relation to inheritance. I did a presentation on that. I went to Acts 15, 13 to 21, referring to the Gentiles, which he, uh, James, the apostle of Christ, uh, uh, cross-referenced with Amos 9, verses 9 to 11, which calls the Gentiles the house of Jacob. So if you're not a Gentile and you're not part of the house of Jacob, then I don't know what you're talking about. And clearly stipulates that they will inherit the Gentiles who are called by his name. So the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David will inherit the Gentiles who are called by his name. So I, I don't understand your, 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 um, and, and I also cross-reference that with Isaiah 58 verse 12 to 14, which makes it clear those who keep the Sabbath, the missing link, will inherit the promises of Jacob. So I don't understand why you would say that. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to go, go to Colossians 2.16, but I'm sure he's going to ask me the question, so I will get the chance to, to respond to that. Uh, what uh, he, he quoted uh, saying that, um, uh, what, what must we do to inherit the kingdom? Jesus himself said, you must keep the commands, the commandments. So I, I don't know why you would even refer to that. Jesus himself said, you must keep the commands to inherit the kingdom. And lastly, inheritance is not related to salvation. Um, well, I provided a, a presentation showing that there was a group of people who will inherit the Gentiles who are called by his name. So the Gentiles who are called by his name are still saved, but they're not the ones who will inherit the kingdom. So that is what you need to address. The, five po the six points I've established, hopefully he will be able to do that because my presentation is based on three witnesses, Isaiah, Amos, and James. So hopefully you'll be able to, to address those uh, the verses I specifically mentioned that addresses the topic of discussion, who will inherit the kingdom of God, address the point of uh, how the Sabbath is di directly stipulated as a means for you to inherit the kingdom as per Isaiah 58 verse 12 to 14, Amos 9 verses uh, 8 to 12, and cross-reference with Acts 15 verses 13 to 21. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Stanley, for that rebuttal. All right, Rick, you're up for your rebuttal. You still have your presentation up, uh, Rick. Uh, let me get rid of it. There you go. All right, there we go. All right, so you got five minutes right. for your rebuttal. So, uh, there's quite a bit. I want to address yeah. yeah, I'm good? Yeah, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. I want to address something that was said about Gentiles not being in it. I've heard this. Uh, many times before, I, I would refer you to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Just read the whole chapter. I don't want to go through it, but read chapter 2 through chapter 3, where it talks about the mystery of Christ. And it talks about that uh, that, there, that Christ made one people, one new man, right? And so with that being said, the theme there is that all of the covenants that were referred to in Ephesians chapter 2 are also referred are also shared or partaken it by the gentiles so that that's pretty clear from scripture don't need to do that just you just need to read those two chapters and that will follow 
Um, also, uh, Stanley keeps talking about uh, Acts 15 in regards to this is a demonstration of keeping Sabbath. One of the things that I, I mentioned in my opening was the fact that Sabbath has nothing to do with worship. Uh, the, the command was about abstaining from work and all your dwelling. So uh, there's, no, there's no text that actually connects Sabbath with work, the work, practice of worship there. So to use that, and here's the thing you need to understand, that there's two definitions you typically see about Sabbath. One is a, a measurement of time. That is, uh, Stanley has multiple videos that talks about seven-day cycles. So he rightly understands that Sabbath can be referred to as a, as a period of time because uh, the Hebrews adopted a, a, a cycle, right, with the last day being the Sabbath. But it also refers to the Fourth Commandment ordinance in the Ten Commandments. Uh, the other thing I want to address is that um, there seems to be some misunderstanding about what it means to inherit the kingdom of God, right? And what I, I, what I would simply refer you to is just read uh, Galatians, uh, starting with Galatians chapter 3, where I made it clear that law and inheritance don't go together, right? I already made that point earlier uh, in Galatians chapter 3, the inheritance is tied to a promise. And so whatever inheritance he's talking about is, is, is obviously there's some crosstalk here. We, I think we need to get on the same page about that. But I'm referring to what God, the purpose, the will, and the work of the triune God and redeeming his people. That's what I'm referring to. And so you see that laid out clearly in Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4. It connects the idea of adoption to the inheritance. So to, if you're not a son, there is no inheritance. They're, they're uh, connected together. You can't separate the two things. And so if you don't have an inheritance, you're not a child of God. And so that's the point when you continue on in Galatians chapter 5 and the Apostle Paul contrast uh, the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. Who has the fruit of the Spirit? Those who actually have the Spirit of God, right? Those who are the children of God. And remember, the Spirit testifies in multiple places that you are a child of Romans chapter 8. Also, you have that in Galatians as well. That testify, bears witness that you're a child of God. Because the whole idea of adoption was an ancient concept in the Greco-Roman world that signified that your debts were paid, that you are now in a new family and with all the family benefits. And in some cases, you are even more secure than the natural son. So to, to not connect the idea of adoption to inheritance, understand those things are together. And if you if you don't have inheritance, you don't have salvation. Is that not the point of First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine, where he says, do not be deceived. If you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is he talking about? He's not talking about rewards or some earthly possessions or something of that nature. He's talking about salvation. That's what's in view there. And so all the context and specifically when I looked at Ephesians chapter one, where it talked about the inheritance that was predestined. Right. What's the context of Ephesians one salvation? Uh, all of the spiritual blessings that come from the heavenlies are what in Christ Jesus and in Christ, in Christ over and over again. So one of the things I, I want to deal with and I hope that Terry addresses is clarification on um, what does it mean to inherit the kingdom of God? Right. And I would say there's no distinction between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven language. I know. In the but that, that that exegetically is not a, a, a safe place to land. Um, what I, I, I do want Terry to kind of clarify more on his view of Amos 9, 11, because uh, he seems to believe that the inheritance is about some physical possession. And that's that's all that's in view here. But the inheritance that we talk about in First Peter chapter one is undefiled, imperishable. We're talking about something greater than what is physical here. So uh, that's all I want to share. I look forward to his uh, response in the rebuttal. All right, guys, good stuff. Appreciate the opening and the rebuttal. So now we're going to transition into the Cross X. Uh, once again, this is a 40-minute total. Both of you guys will get 20 minutes each to cross-examine your debate partner. Uh, in that, uh, make sure that if you get that, get that question out as soon as possible. So we're going to allow the responder to have one minute to get that question. All right.
I think that's what we agreed on, right? One minute to ask a question, and then one minute to respond yeah. to the question. So let's make exactly. sure that we let's make sure that we're getting that question in, not rambling on too long. And if, it, if possible, if you can answer that question with a yes or no, let's do that. All right. So with that said, Stanley, you're up for your 20 minute cross X, uh, Rick Caldwell. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So I'm on. So um, I gave a presentation. Uh, I didn't see you try to respond uh, to most of the points I've made. Uh, I provided three witnesses, uh, J uh, J uh, James, Amos, and Isaiah, and I didn't see you really respond to that. But before I go there, I need to get my mind set on your, what your position is. Are you part of the congregation of Israel? Are you part of the commonwealth of Israel as Paul stipulates? Yes or no? Uh, when you say the commonwealth of Israel, it says, if you're, are you referring, I can't answer the question, but I assume you're referring to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, are, are you Israel? Covering. That's a that's the question. Are you Israel? That's the question. I am not the nation of Israel, no. But I I believe that the, the Bible talks uh, about a spiritual Israel. I, okay, I make a uh, distinction. I, I, I wanted to, I want to define my terms because we gotta be very specific. When we say Israel, what are we talking about? Okay, so I want to make it clear because you made a, a a statement suggesting that uh, the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and the Sabbath was a covenant between um uh god and israel so when you're saying with uh, between god and israel you're referring to the uh a nation of israel that's correct that was a nation that was established in exodus okay uh i just stipulated uh so exodus 12 verse uh 18 19 uh 48 and 49 clearly stipulates that those who kept the passover one of the feast days were part of the commonwealth or the congregation of israel um what is your understanding of Gentiles being part of the congregation of Israel. Well, uh, at, you no, know, they were all they were they were not Israel until they were established by the uh, the law of Sinai. So that that would be my response. So yeah, there were there were there was a mixed multitude that left Israel, but the establishment of them as a nation took place at Sinai. That would be my response. Uh, I'm going to repeat my question. Maybe you didn't get my question. I didn't ask, you said is uh, uh, the sign of the Sabbath is with Israel and God and is the Israel you're referring to is a nation. I just gave you a reference. Exodus 12, verse 18, 19, 48 yes. and 49 says that the stranger is part of the congregation of Israel. So can you explain to me your understanding of supposedly the Sabbath being a sign with Israel, a nation, as opposed to the strangers being part of the congregation of Israel? Because you know, so it seems to contradict the, your position. The answer, yeah, the answer is really clear because you never see anywhere where God establishes a covenant sign with other nations besides the nation of Israel. That's clear in the text. He never he never did that. So whether so, okay, so, 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 so go ahead. So uh, so you're not responding to Exodus 12 verse 18, 19, 48 I, and 49. I I How about I yeah, give you uh, you're still talking about nation. It's not talking about nation here. It's said congregation. It's nation, congregation, two different words. Uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 14 verse 1 says, they will be incorporated inside of Israel. Uh, when they're saying they will be incorporated inside of Israel, are you suggesting that uh, they will be incorporated inside of the nation of Israel? Strangers. Isaiah well, 14 it, verse 1. It was pretty, yeah, so it's pretty clear. I would agree that when the sojourner came, there was one law, the same law for Israel and the same law for the sojourner while the sojourner was with them. So that's clear in multiple texts. I don't disagree with that. So I have no problem with that. But what what but what I'm saying is that there there was a nation established. Gentiles were not that nation. There there's a clearly a distinction in the Bible between Gentiles and Israel. And you see that uh, for example in Romans chapter in Romans 9 where it still tells about prerogatives and special privileges that the nation had so there, there's a clear physical distinction between Israel and the other nation and all right so you didn't three, another text to think about all right no problem so you didn't really respond to Ezekiel uh, Isaiah 14 you now you refer to Leviticus 24 22 saying there's one law for the stranger and the native born but you're said that the Sabbath which is the law part of the law uh is only with israel the nation so you just contradicted yourself but uh, i have another question because you're saying you could still be a gentile and be uh in uh, in court uh and be in covenant with jesus christ uh, what it uh, says in psalm 45 verse um 
verse it says uh okay uh for, okay let go you guys say what does it say teach you great things a little stair palace is a mountain standing okay verse 10 as uh, song 45 verse 10 hearken or daughter talking about the church and consider and incline your air forget your own people and your father's health do you uh concur with this are, are you willing to say that you are willing to i don't know what your um uh which nation you're from are you willing to say that you're willing to forget your own people and uh the house of your father to become part of the congregation of israel are you do you hold to the same uh proclamation made in uh, psalms 45 verse 10 I, I do not follow your assertion. In fact, I do not agree with your use of the word church, how you're using it, because the word church uh, fundamentally means a congregation. So context determines meaning. And I, what I believe is that we're grafting into Christ. That's what I believe scripture teaches, not into Israel. Well, Romans 11 would uh, totally refutes your, your position. Your, it says you're branched in into the, uh, the olive tree. And that olive tree is the, the congregation of Israel in context. Uh, so uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, let me ask you this question. Jeremiah 31, 31, it clearly stipulates that it's a covenant with Judah and Israel. Which covenant are you part of? I am in covenant with, I'm in the new covenant by virtue of the consummate Israel, uh, Israelite Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of uh, Ephesians chapter two and uh, chapter three. The mystery of Christ that was revealed, that Paul revealed, that that great mystery was that Gentiles are also part of the new covenant by virtue of Christ Jesus. That's my answer. So uh, thank you. You went to, to Ephesians. I didn't go to Ephesians because uh, you're using scripture to contradict scripture. I'm going to show you when you go to, uh, and ask me questions, I'm going to be able to address your scripture and, uh, and put it in its proper context. Can you ex address the, the scripture that I presented to you, which is, Jeremiah 31, 31, saying that the law will be put in the hearts, the covenant, the Ten Commands, and it's a covenant, the new covenant is with Judah and Israel. Which one are you part of? That's my question to you. I've in light of what Jeremiah you, 31. Man. I've already gave you the answer. Uh, uh, and, sir, if you want me to answer, or is there a new question? Okay, so so I, I want to make sure uh, people can understand your position. You're saying when it says uh, a covenant with Israel, you're saying that's the consummate Israel, uh, Israel, uh, that's referring to Jesus? Because you said the consummate Israelite, the true Jesus. Vine. So are you saying Every, what, everyone, okay, so what, who, everyone who saved is attached to the true vine referred to in John 15. I, if we remember, Israel was the typical vine back in Isaiah. So he fulfilled all things that Israel did not do. We're attached to him. I want to make sure you understand, people can understand your position. There's a covenant with Judah. You're saying that's a people, right? But when it says covenant with Israel, you're not saying it's a people, you're saying it's Jesus? Because that's basically what I'm understanding your position is. Is that your position? No, that's not my position. I, I think you're so when so, 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 so I'm going to ask the question again. It says the yeah. people of it, uh, Judah, there's a covenant with them. And there's yeah, the people of Israel, people. a covenant yeah. with them. Yeah. Okay, so which one are you part of? Which people? Christ. That's all people are connected to Christ. Okay. okay. That's the point. All right. All right. I think we can move on. Okay. So when it says uh, house of Judah is Christ as well, right? Yes. Christ ultimately fulfills okay. that. So, uh, so, all, so, all so it's Christ. Promises, Christ. No all the spiritual promises are, uh, that's called second, uh, second Corinthians chapter one twenty. all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So I'm, I'm just, no I'm problem, fine no with problem. all of what scripture says to you. No problem. So I'm going to go back to my six points that, I've, uh, that you didn't really address to. Uh, number one, uh, why uh, can you explain to me in order to for you to win this debate, you have to explain why Gentiles who are incorporated in Israel would not be required to keep the Sabbath in light of the fact that the scripture st clearly stipulates what you refer to Leviticus 24, 22, one standard of law for the native born and the stranger. What is your response to that? The Mosaic law, we're under the new covenant. Uh, paradigm and so under the new covenant paradigm there's no there's we're not we're we are we are we are we put our trust in christ jesus under that new paradigm my friend and so we are not under that law in fact the text i would refer you to is first corinthians chapter 9 verses 19 to 21 where paul makes a distinction between the law of moses and the law of christ 
Christians, we're under the law of Christ. We're not antinomian. We're under the law of Christ. So we follow the words of Christ as he is laid out. And as disciples, we follow his words. That's what he said. True disciples will keep my word. That's what John 8 says. It seems to me you're suggesting that the words of scripture, which is from the model of God, relayed by a prophet is not the word of Christ. So that's very interesting. Uh, is, that a question? Question. Uh, is that a question? No, I, I'm gonna, I, yeah. I, that's I, a preamble. Now I'm going to ask you the question. Uh, quick question. Um, when you're saying uh, the covenant, uh, the new covenant, it, it says in Jeremiah 31, the law will be put in our hearts. Which law is it talking about? Well, it depends on what you mean. So we know that uh, the law, every covenant had a set of laws. The Noahic covenant had a set of laws and conditions. Uh, that are different from the Mosaic Covenant. So here, every covenant has its own expression of God's law. That's the point I'm making, if, if I haven't been clear before. So under the All right. covenant dispensation, we don't, we're not over here sacrificing animals. We're not keeping feast days. We're not doing any of that. Why? Because all of that was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. All of that. And not just the ceremonial. The whole law was fulfilled in Christ Jesus because there's no tripartite separation of the law because you know in the Old Testament that they considered the, the law to be the whole law that had to be kept. All right, so perfect. So in light of what you just said here, uh, can you explain to me why Deuteronomy 5.22, Deuteronomy 10.2 makes a clear distinction between the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and Deuteronomy 31.26 with the rest of the law, making a clear distinction. The Ten Commandments were in the Ark of the Covenant, and the rest was a witness against us at the side of the covenant. And Paul himself refers to that by saying in 1 Corinthians 7.19 that uh, um, circumcision, uncircumcision is, is, is worth nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. What uh, commandments is Paul referring to uh, when he said that? Yeah, so, so here's the thing. Uh... There's a, you said a lot, so I, I might need you to repeat the second half of that. So I'll deal with it, the, okay. the, 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 yeah. last, the last part of my question. When Paul said, because he's making a distinction, you're saying that the, the law, all of it is together. Paul is making a distinction. So I'm challenging your understanding of the law. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, circumcision and uncircumcision is nothing, distinction, as opposed to what? The keeping of the commandments of God. So number one question what is Paul referring to when he said to keep another commandments of God? Yeah, so what what, he, what Paul, let's be clear there, that Paul is talking about outward uh, lip service or outward religiosity is is not the uh, the issue. The issue is obedience. Uh, that's that's the issue there. Knowing the law and being and having access to the law and, and, and calling yourself a, a covenant person uh, means nothing if you're not obeying God. Right. That's that's what he's talking about there. Uh, he's militating against the argument that, hey, I, I'm, I'm a covenant person. I'm a I'm an Israelite. Well, that means nothing if you're not obeying God. That's the point that Paul's making uh, in that text in regards to the law. Well, I already answered that question. Uh, the law, if it's referring to the Mosaic law and typically Paul refers to the Mosaic law in Romans, he, when he says under law, hupo no man. He's talking about the law of Moses. So that would include all that came out of Sinai, including the Ten Commandments. So so uh, quickly, a preamble before I ask my next question. So you're saying yeah. that when he says commandments of God, it refers to the whole law, but circumcision and uncircumcision is also part of the law. So you're saying he's not making a yeah. distinction when it is a dis So it seems to me the logic you're applying is really contradictory. Uh, so my next question to you, um, um, are you aware that Revel uh, Revelation eleven nineteen says the Ark of the Covenant is in the heaven? So if there's a change to the Ten Commandments, um, is it also a change in, in heaven? There's no Revelation change. eleven nineteen. Who, who, who argued that? I never argued there's a change to the Ten Commandments. That was that hasn't been my argument. So so there's a co the, the covenant in heaven. The covenant is in heaven, and when it uh, and the covenant is not on earth. So this this. A covenant in heaven, the Ten Commandments, but it's not a covenant on earth. Is, is that your position? Yeah, I, I haven't said anything about a covenant in heaven and covenant. I, you're, 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 you're saying that. I'm the one saying. I'm, I'm the saying, one saying there's the Ten Commandments yeah. in heaven. So, so yeah, we're not to keep those Ten Commandments on earth. Is what you're saying? What I'm saying is that what we see in the New Testament is nine of the Ten Commandments repeated in the New Testament, expressed under the New Covenant. You know what's not repeated? The one we're debating about, Sabbath. 
no one was upbraided for for not keeping the Sabbath. That's the whole heart of the debate, right? Do you have to keep the Sabbath? Wait, wait, wait. That's what wasn't okay. Okay, that, that, okay now it's, it seems like you're tip, uh, now you're changing your position because first it was no. the whole covenant doesn't apply to strangers. First, your whole thing is the whole covenant doesn't apply to strangers. The whole law of Moses doesn't apply to strangers. Now you're saying the nine commandments do, but now the Sabbath doesn't. Okay, I have a next question, uh, next challenge. Uh, why he? Um, can you explain to me uh, why he argue? Uh, why you argue against Sabbath keep, keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that they work in the synagogue every Sabbath, as per Acts fifteen twenty one? Yeah. So you had you had some people that were called God fearers, uh, but I don't think that text, like like I said before is making the case i mean you're gonna have to look at who's that them referring to there in context in verse 21 now you would argue gentiles uh but you have the jerusalem council there it may be argued that the jews that are there so i don't think that's a definitive text to go to to try to make the argument that gentiles are in the synagogue uh i i i think that would be a hard sell you don't have anything definitive there to to go with contextually that's the only interpretation that you can give especially get in light of the fact that it says they will learn the law of moses are you saying jews didn't know the law of moses no i mean the law of moses was always taught in the synagogue to the to the jewish people to the jewish nation but it that, goes that, against that, that the, the very point that you just made no but it says they will learn they will get acquainted with the law of moses it's talking about the gentiles you just said that verse 21 is about jews but the Jews already no, knew no, here's, the, here's the law of Moses. I said two things. I said two things. I said one, you obviously have people like Cornelius, right? A couple chapters back, who was considered a God fearer. So you had people. Well, well, you, you wanted examples, but I don't think that's a definitive text. I'm not talking about Cornelius. Gentiles, Verse 21. Gentiles are keeping keeping the Moses the same comments. See, one of the things that I think you have a problem with is understanding the difference between pre prescriptive text. And descriptive, uh, and descriptive text. Where is the right. imperative in the new commandment that says you must keep the Sabbath? That's what I'm looking for. Uh, you could ask me that later on. Uh, next question: okay. um, uh, If you are, uh, why do you argue against Sabbath keep, uh, keeping uh, for Gentiles in light of the fact that Amos 9:12 clearly stipulates the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David will inherit the Gentiles who are called by His name? Uh. Where the word is inherit there? is there because that's the that's the debate we're having. Inherit. So we have. Where? Yeah, let's allow him to answer the question, uh, Stanley. Okay. No, so he, he asked me a question. Where is the Sabbath? Yeah. So in that text, and I, uh, what was that? Amos nine. Verse twelve. I just read it. Let me let me just pull it up. Just give me a second. I'm going to read it for you because I, I have some okay, my time. Okay, go ahead and read it. Uh, That's easier. Go uh, ahead and read it. Why do you argue that Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that Amos 9.12 clearly stipulates who are uh, the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David will inherit the Gentiles who are called by his name? Yeah. So here, here's the issue there. And I, and I put a note there. And I, I, I'm glad you remind me. I'm getting old. I'm getting old, Stanley. So the issue there is uh, what is referred to as a tabernacle of David? that there uh obviously back in acts chapter 15 you see reference to that there i think one of the things we need to consider is what is what is the meaning of that i'm not asking a question i'm just putting a thought out there because it's not my time to ask questions all right i, I think, think i making, did a whole presentation a fallacious connection between tabernacle of david and then assuming sabbath keeping is connected to that I, wait, I, wait, wait, wait! I, I didn't talk about. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't make the connection yet. I, my next question is going to be the connection. I didn't make the connection yet. I just yeah. clearly stipulated that those Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David will inherit the Gentiles who are called by His name. I'm just showing you two classes of different people who are saved, because that goes against your whole position, suggesting that inheritance is directly connected to salvation. Both of them are saved, but one group of people will inherit. Uh, and now, as it relates to uh, uh, the Sabbath keeping, my question to you is Isaiah 58. Uh, let, me, let me see. Uh, why do you argue against Sabbath keeping uh, for Gentiles in light of the fact that Isaiah 58, 12 to 14 clearly stipulates that they will inherit the promises of Jacob, uh, clearly uh, uh, referring to the Sabbath as being the means by which they will uh, uh, um, uh, acquire this inheritance? Isaiah 15, uh, 58, verse 12 to uh, 14. 
That is the connection yeah, since reason. Isaiah 58. Just to yeah. finalize, Isaiah okay. 58 is cross reference direct and directly related same prophecy as amos 9 verses uh, 9 to 12. go ahead yeah i think there's been a lot of crosstalk here when it comes to definition of inheritance uh i i mean about the ultimate fulfillment in christ jesus you're talking about something with physical uh things and a people uh and 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 clearly if you look at what the apostles have taught there that's not the emphasis i'm talking about so i think i think some clarity on that the other thing is, is that um, just like Isaiah 56 and 50, let's throw them both in there together, since uh, that was one of the texts that we both brought up that deal with uh, the strangers and the Sabbath. We're still talking about the old covenant, my friend, and the ultimate fulfillment of everything here. For, for example, in Isaiah 56, verse one, talks about the revealing of his righteousness. Now, obviously that's talking about in context, the post-exilic period when the uh, children of Israel will come out of Babylonian captivity, but that will also point to the full fulfillment in Christ. So obviously in context back then, they're under the Mosaic law. They're gonna be talking about things about Sabbath and things, because that's the covenant they're under. But the ultimate fulfillment will be in Christ Jesus, who is the, uh, the ultimate rest that we read about in Hebrews chapter four. That's all I have to say on that. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right, Rick, you're up for your 20 minute cross hex. Uh, Mr. Stanley Terry. All right. First question for you, because I, I, I want to address the issue of a statement you made. You said the Gentiles are not uh, in a, a covenant. They don't have a covenant. Not if they're not part of it. Sure all Gentiles, I, 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 I respond. Genesis uh, 49 verse the promises made uh, of, from, uh, of Jacob to uh, about the child Israel, it says the, the descendants of Israel will be the fullness or the ingathering of the Gentiles. So the prophecy shows that those who are in covenant with Jesus, the strangers who keep his, com uh, his commandments, I give a, a couple examples, Isaiah 56, verse six and seven, the stranger who keeps the Sabbath, who is in covenant with him, et cetera, et cetera, will be brought to his holy mountain inheritance uh, uh, and they're called the congregation. Uh, they're called Israel in verse, uh, verse, uh, verse eight. So uh, the the stranger is called Israel. So the spiritual Israel, okay. as per Psalms eighty seven, those who are born from heaven. All right. So let me ask a follow up question, in reference to Isaiah fifty six, where it talks about these strangers being brought to the holy mountain. How how do you ultimately see that? Do you see a New Testament fulfillment of that? And if so, what is the New Testament fulfillment? In no, there's not a new. This uh, the this is a of and uh, uh, the new kingdom to, to be established on earth. It says, uh, and and I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. The burnt and directly uh, relating the Sabbath to worship because you suggested that Sabbath is ne never uh, in relation to worship. But here it seems like worship to me prayer, burnt offerings, sacrifices on my altar for my house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. And the Lord God, which gathered the outcasts of Israel, speaking about the Gentiles again, I will gather unto him, uh, um, yet I will gather others to him besides, to who? To the outcasts of Israel, uh, uh, besides those that are gathered to him. So he will gather more strangers, more Gentiles to the uh, uh, to Israel and we see the culmination in that in Isaiah 6, uh, 66, 23. It's from Sabbath to Sabbath for all flesh come to worship. That's the new that's new kingdom uh, language there. Thank you. All right, next question. You Do you consider yourself to be a Christian? Of course. That's why I'm here. Okay, so, okay very good. So according to, do you, according to the New Testament scriptures, where do we see any of the apostles, including uh, any of the apostles, uh, mandating that any believer, any follower of Christ has to keep the Sabbath. Well, I did a whole presentation on the Acts 15, um, where is, which clearly stipulates that. Huh? Where is the commandment in Acts 15? Where is the commandment for Sabbath keeping in Acts 15? Yeah, the is that your question? not a description, but a commandment. Uh, he doesn't have to uh, say, hey, keep the Sabbath. First Corinthians 7, 19. Keep, 
uh, circumcision and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. That's good enough. He doesn't have to stipulate the Sabbath to, for people to keep the Sabbath. But Jesus Christ did refer to the Sabbath saying, uh, make sure that your flight is not in the winter or during the Sabbath. So he's talking about a so, future event after his death, so check, uh, burial and resurrection. All right. So let me ask you this question. You say you don't have to, they have to say it. Well, you have Gentiles, Gentiles in Ephesus, Gentiles in Colossae that don't know about the sabbath how how would how was this information communicated to them they wouldn't have known about it they're they're gentiles uh, well it, it clearly stipulates in scripture that uh, paul says that uh god winks at people's ignorance and that's the whole purpose of this debate who will inherit the kingdom those who keep the law will inherit it and those who are not familiar with the law will get to learn it in the kingdom to come uh, uh the children that died during the wilderness uh, uh if a child dies uh, at uh, before the age of uh, accountability, they will learn about the law and the kingdom to come. There's uh, specific examples of those who are ignorant of it, but those who are aware of it, then it, it, it becomes a question of salvation. But the debate here is not about salvation, it's about inheritance, and you have to keep the Sabbath, the seven day Sabbath, to inherit the kingdom. As I've established, Isaiah 58, 12, 14, Amos 9, verse 9 to 12, and cross reference with Acts 15, 13 to 21. So, so, so you're telling me that, that there is a clear command that Gentiles are supposed to follow, but there's not a clear directive from any of the apostles to keep that command? Is that, don't you find that problematic? In this? No, it says in Acts 15, 21, they will learn the law of Moses and they were there every Sabbath. So they, were, they, they, know, they knew where to come to, to, to learn about so, the word of God. So question, how is that how do you how do you deal with that when 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 19 to 21 where Paul clearly says in that text that he's not under the law of Moses anymore but under the law of yeah. Christ. So how yeah, how I, do I you totally agree. that? Well, Paul said also said in 1 Corinthians 7:19 there's a distinction between the law of Moses circumcision and the commandments of God. I'm here to speak about the eternal covenant which is clearly distinct from the rest of the law. Deuteronomy 5.22, Deuteronomy 10.2, Revelation 11.19, the law is in, uh, the covenant is in heaven. Uh, Psalms 119.89, the covenant is eternal, as opposed to Deuteronomy 31.26, which is the rest of the law, which is uh, at the side of the co covenant, Ark of the Covenant, and is a witness against you. So uh, there's a clear distinction there. Does, does not... Uh... Acts chapter 15 verse 1 clearly stipulate that 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 circumcision is part of the law of Moses and more than Gentiles not, not by the, required to be circumcised. No, not, no it's, it definitely doesn't say that. Uh, I don't know where you get from Acts 15. You're talking about the Judaizers who did believe that, but the, the apostles of God uh, of Christ did not preach that. And you cannot find that nowhere in scripture that they did preach that. I don't so even need to question. read it. I, I, I know. Let me move on because I, I, I press on for time. So let me understand how did how what is your view of what the apostles believed when they referred to inheritance? What were the apostles talking about? For example, and I'll give you a, a text to reference. In uh, Galatians chapter five at verse twenty one, when the apostle Paul talked about inherit, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, and he lists the works of the flesh. Is that not a yeah. salvation issue in view there? Yeah, uh, you said you you uh, appeal to logic. Uh, you, I, I made it clear, both ends, those who inherit and those who will be inherited, are saved. So yeah, but I'm talking about inheritance here. Is it both group? But uh, I I know what you brought me to Galatians, and my point to you is salvation is necessary for both groups. But the inheritance of the kingdom is for those who keep the law and who are familiar with it, and they will teach those who were ignorant of it. Uh, uh, across history, because a lot of people, uh, for example, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Cyrus, he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but I'm sure he didn't know all the stipulations as it relates to the law, although he had a, a, a Jewish uh, wife. But I know Nebuchadnezzar didn't keep the Sabbath. There's no reference to that, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is, is that there's a two groups of people, but both of them are saved. Those who are ignorant, so those who fight against the Sabbath. So according, that's all the so I want to make sure we understand. I want to make sure I'm following you. I'm, I'm, I'm referring yes. to Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-one. Are the yes, people who 
that Paul is referring here that's in that list are these yes. saved individuals? They are saved. Yes. First uh, Corinthians who... chapter. Okay, go I, I just I, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep moving. First Corinthians chapter six verse nine. Are those people saved? He said, what those, does it if say, you do uh, these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. No, no, if, if they, don't, if they do, yeah, yeah, they, they won't you inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, they don't. All right, so that's a salvation inherit. issue. Yeah. Of course. Both groups must right, not do so these now, things. So what's the difference between Galatians 5, 21 at this symbol and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 that has a similar list? And, you, and you cut out, you cut out. Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the what's question? The you cut out. What's the are you? Do you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Do you hear me? What's yeah, the difference hearing. between your response in Galatians five twenty one? What does it say? Galatians those people are saved. You said those people who don't practice, the who do practice those things, are saved. That's what you said. No, 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 no. I said that's not what I meant. Those okay, who practice any iniquity. Okay. Okay. No, anyone who practices uh, lawlessness will not inherit the kingdom. That's my position. All right, so that's a salvation issue. I I, I said that multiple times already. Both groups must all right. So, uh, the, so not would practice you, lawlessness. Would, would you agree? Would you agree? Like, next question. Would you agree that in this context, in which and all and I would I would argue that all the context in regards to inheritance in the new new text, earthly inheritance or something that that we've been going around around, but all the context in the in the epistles is salvific. And, and and it's in its constitution which means all that the, to not and in the new testament all of the all of the inheritance passages like ephesians 1 ephesians 5 5 1 corinthians 9 6 9, uh, 6, 9 galatians 5 21 would you say all of have salvation in view or is a salvation issue in view i i i say it's part I don't say it's, uh, it's uh, the fullness of what inheritance means. I say that's part of it. You have All to right. be saved for you to inherit. In, but you can, in you can be four, saved and not inherit. Yeah, in Galatians chapter 4, uh, what is the basis? What is the basis of uh, one? Do you understand? Let me ask you this way. In Galatians chapter 4, it talks about the whole idea of adoption. And, and Paul makes an argument from Galatians chapter, I would, I would argue from chapter three all the way to chapter five in Galatians about the significance of adoption and consequently uh, inheritance. So the point is going back, and if you look at Galatians chapter four, where around verse four and following, where it talks about adoption and it talks about the Holy Spirit bears witness that we are children of God, similar to what you see in Romans chapter eight, to not have an inheritance is to not be a child of God based on what Paul is saying. Do you do you not see that? Do you see the connection well, that Paul is making as, there as between as inheritance my, and being a child? My, my, my response to that is if you do have the Holy Spirit, it will uh, lead you to obedience as per Acts 5.22. So uh, is, it, is it Acts 5.22? Let me see. Acts 5. X five, I don't remember which uh, which verse, but it's it, it's an X five saying that the Holy Spirit uh, leads you to obedience. So uh, I would be questioning your your whether or not you really do have the Holy Spirit if you're not obeying His yeah. word. Yeah, and, and, and likewise, wouldn't you also say going back to Galatians chapter five where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit? You can only have the fruit of the Spirit if you have the Spirit, correct? Yeah, and the law is spiritual, as per uh, Romans seven fourteen. We're not talk we're not talking about the law we're talking about the holy spirit okay no the so holy spirit uh, yeah we're jumping no, no, into no, a different uh, uh, the fruit i'm just right, saying the fruit of the me. spirit it's fruit of the spirit so the, the law is spiritual so I, i'm just making the correlation they're both spiritual yeah. so the, the 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 point i'm trying to make there is uh, i want to kind of nail the point home is that if you agree that without the holy spirit if you don't have the holy spirit you're not a child of god right yeah yeah all right i agree and and it says that uh there in the text that to have to be a child of god according to uh galatians 4 and connected that to galatians 5 is that you are you are adopted you're adopted into the family of god is do you agree with that exactly either okay. either the uh, you're you're adopted inside of israel or judah 
one of the two. Okay, and I want to continue on. So you're you're adopted for what? What do you mean, uh, adopted for what? For are, are all those adopted into the family of God, a co-heirs with Christ, according to Romans eight? Yes, yeah, of course, of course. Okay, all right. So we so you do understand that salvifically there is a there is a understanding of inheritance and that and would you not agree that and this is the point i'm trying to make that the apostles that's the point they're making when they use when they talk about inheritance in galatians and ephesians and even in colossians and so no. when you when you, i want to bring up another passage uh if you look at colossians chapter one colossians chapter one verse 12 and following it says that we are in the kingdom now that we have been placed into the kingdom you agree with that yeah the light uh, if you are walking if you're children of the light you walk according to uh his commandments as per first john chapter two uh first john chapter two is good enough keeping yeah, his commandments but, but isn't the issue here and i'll read the text given thank given thanks unto the father which have made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So in agree, all of that, 100%. you agree with all of that? Do you see anything we've done in that text, any action that we've done in those two verses? Well, if you just limit it to that verse, yeah, I guess uh, you could make your point. But Paul says, work out your salvation. Uh, Philippians 4 um, says, uh, uh, obedience yeah, is directly yeah, related to that. our let's walk. Romans 1, 5. What, what is he, what, when Paul says in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, to work out your salvation, yeah, not yeah. work for, but work out with fear and trembling. Yeah. Uh, but he continues for it's God's purpose to work and the will for his good pleasure, right? That's the continuing yeah. finish part of that verse. That is, would you art, would you agree that's our sanctification in view, not how one gets entered into the household of God? But once we're in the household of God, our duty to uh be holy, yeah, basically, and that uh, uh, that uh, relates to. Yes, and that relates to keeping his commandments. Uh, I agree with every verse that you just provided, but you're trying to uh, uh, remove obedience from this whole process. And I'm saying no. I know. Every I verse actually, that you I, I didn't say it. No, no, no. no. no obedience to the Ten Commandments. Because I just brought up obedience to the Ten Commandments. Two, verse 12 and 13, which deals with obedience. So I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not shooting myself no. in the foot by bringing up a text that actually talks about that. But the point, so let me continue. The point is yeah, obedience continue. to the law, to the, the Ten Commandments. That's my point. Yeah, You're talking about obedience. I don't know what to, presented obedience. I don't know what your law Here's is. Here's next question. Here's my next question. When you read yes. First Corinthians chapter nine, let's go there and I'll read it real quick. Uh, First go Corinthians ahead. chapter nine, verses nineteen and following. It says here. Um, for though I am free from all men, yet I have been, I have made myself a servant unto all, that I might again be again the more. And unto the Jew I became as a Jew, that I might gain Jews to them that were under the law. Hupo no man. That's the that's the phrase there that Paul often uses, yeah. especially in Romans, as under the law, and that I might gain them that are under the law, right? To them that are without law, as without law, being not without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, or actually, technically, it says, in law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law, right? So Paul, oftentimes you see Paul doing things throughout, especially in Acts, right? Uh, okay. You know, Acts 17, Paul went to the synagogue and, and, and taught and reason with the people for three Sabbaths, right? He did things uh, in order to gain a witness, to have a witness among that Jewish audience, right? So the point here, okay. here's the point. The point I'm trying to make is that a question? Paul, Paul, does not Paul say he's under the law of Christ? And my question to you is, then what is the law of Christ according to the text of scripture? Everything that he stipulated what is the law and he's of told. 
everything that he stipulated uh, and everything that the, the, his disciples and those that were close to him relate to us, which is keeping his commandments. If you love me, keep my, my commandments. And um, and I believe it's not just in the New Testament, everything he says in the Old Testament. I believe Jesus, the son of God and his pre-incarnate uh, uh, body was the one speaking in the Old Testament. So try to make a, a, a Christ in the New Testament different from the, Christ, from the, the son of God in the Old Testament is very problematic. Okay, so back to the Jerusalem Council. In light of what you just said, and you see the declaration uh, in the Jerusalem Council here, uh, I'm gonna go to verse... You got like a minute, huh? So if you got yeah, the, I got a question... Yeah, I got probably the last question. Um, it's got quite interesting. You didn't really address much about inheritance, but okay. Yeah, we talked about inheritance quite a bit. Uh, yeah, but and he said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get this in." The letters they wrote in this manner: the apostles and the elders and the brethren said, "Send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles." And reading verse twenty-three, uh, uh, which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls." saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law there it is you said it wasn't there it's right there in the text law it's of right moses. there in the text yeah the law of moses which includes all I, of these i didn't argue for the law whole sign, it's the whole sign covenant all right okay. to whom you have a question no such commandment so how do you square verse 24 and like i said you've been you know you're told here to keep the law and obviously that refers to the law of moses how do you square that in light of what, well, what you said? I, I think I made it clear. You could learn the law of Moses uh, without having, because there's many things in the law of Moses that are not applicable. There's no temple mm -hmm. that is not applicable. Um, um, this, the whole book of Leviticus becomes hard to keep. There's a whole bunch of laws that are not applicable to certain people. But I clearly stipulated what 1 Corinthians seven nineteen says. There's a distinction between the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments, circumcision, and the commandments of God, Deuteronomy five twenty two, Deuteronomy ten two clearly distinguishes the covenant from Deuteronomy thirty one twenty six. All of the rest of the laws I made and ordinances I made that clear. The covenant is eternal, Psalms one nineteen eighty nine, Revelation eleven nineteen. I made that clear. You cannot say the same for the rest of the laws. You, know, you never see that the rest of the laws are eternal or in, or in or the law is in heaven. You will never see that. Only the covenant is in heaven. The covenant that he made, the new covenant, the law will be in our hearts. So we know what he's talking about, the Ten Commandments. That's what we need to argue for, not the circumcision. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for the very lively cross X. And uh, it's good stuff, good stuff. Uh, you guys did a great job. All right, so now what we're going to do, we're going to transition to our closing remarks. These are five-minute closings, and then we have some Q&A. So, audience, make sure you get your questions in to uh, so these guys interact with them, all right? Now, that said, uh, Stanley, you're up first for your five-minute closing, and I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak. So, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I think I have um, – I was able to establish my case uh, uh, decisively. I provided six challenges to my uh, interlocutor, and uh, let's go through them real quick, do a quick recap and see what was established or how he responded to them. Uh, number one, I said, why Gentiles who are incorporated inside of Israel would not be required, uh, required to keep the Sabbath in light of the fact that scripture stipulates Leviticus 24, 22, uh, one standard of law for the native born and the stranger. Now, there was so many different responses given to this specific issue. One of his stances was uh, that the law, the Sabbath, was only with the nation of Israel. Then he contradicted himself by saying Leviticus 24, 22, one standard of law for the native one and the stranger. So I'm trying to figure out what his position is. Then he transitioned from, okay, uh, the, uh, the, the Sabbath we don't have to keep, but the ninth commandments we have to keep. And then he's saying we don't have to keep it. It's the law of Christ. We're all over the place, right? So, and then I asked him, um, if you're not part of Israel, which covenant are you part of? Then he suggested, because I, I referred to Jeremiah 3131, covenant with Judah, covenant with Israel. Then he said Israel was somehow Jesus. 
So it's, it's not talking about a people group, but it's talking about one person. So I said, what about Judah? Then he was forced to say the same thing. So basically the verse doesn't make any sense. So I think he felt uh, miserably as it relates to that. And I said, I would all do respect. Uh, challenge number two, why he, uh, he argued against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that they are, were becoming acquainted with the law of Moses as per Acts 15, 21. His response to that was to somehow suggest the Acts 15, 21 is not about the Gentiles, it's about Jews. So Jews will learn about the law of Moses. That is quite surprising and very desperate, to say the least. Uh, challenge number three, um, why would he argue against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in the latter of the fact that there were in the synagogues at every Sabbath, as per Acts 15, 21? He again referred to the same verse and suggested that it's about Jews. Everybody could read the verse for themselves. It's certainly not talking about the Jews. Uh, challenge number four, uh, he, he argued against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in the latter of the fact that Amos 9, 12 clearly stipulates the Gentiles who are part of the tabernacle of David will inherit the Gentiles who are called by his name. So we see two classes of different people, those who are part of the tabernacle of David, which James clearly cross-references with Amos 9 verses, uh, uh, verses 11, 8 to 12 saying that it is Israel, the house of Judah, the house of Jacob. So the Gentiles are called the house of Judah, the house of Jacob. And they are referred to as the one who are part of the tabernacle of David. This is the reason why he said, this is what the prophet said about these Gentiles in, in, uh, in context. So he somehow suggested that my interpretation of uh, Amos 9 verse 12 was uh, uh, lacking, but he didn't explain why. He just said it, it, it was in the proper uh, interpretation while i have i gave three uh witnesses isaiah amos and james all support my position then uh challenge number four five he argued against sabbath keeping for gentiles in light of the fact that isaiah 58 12 to 14 clearly stipulates that they will inherit the promises of god of uh, jacob so the gentiles are called that uh um are, are said to inherit which is the 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 topic uh, uh of the, the debate the debate topic who will inherit uh, uh the promises do you need to keep sabbath and isaiah 58 clearly stipulates that the missing link is uh, uh, adding more information to what amos provided cross reference with acts 15 which is talking about gentiles that they would need to keep the sabbath in order for them to inherit the promises it's conditional so i i don't understand um his response to that was quite, um, I, I don't remember what he said, but it, I, I, I doubt he was able to, to, to adequately respond to that. And finally, he argued against Sabbath keeping for Gentiles in light of the fact that Isaiah 56 verse 6 and 8, uh, 6 to 8 clearly stipulate the conditional basis by which one can be in covenant with Jesus Christ. Because the Sabbath is directly uh, uh, um, connected to the, being in covenant with God, as per Isaiah 56 verse 6, and be brought to his holy mountain, which is a future fulfillment. He somehow suggested this is something that happened in, in the New Testament. But we know the culmination of this verse. We can see that in Isaiah 66, 23, saying from Sabbath to Sabbath, this is new kingdom language. Every nation will come to worship him. So every flesh will come to worship him. So this is clearly stipulating that this is a, 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 a kingdom language. And in, in verse uh, 8, it's, they refer to the Gentiles as people, uh, as uh, Israel, being uh, branched in into Israel. So uh, if he's not part of Israel, then there's no covenant with him because there's no covenant with Gentiles who are not incorporated inside of Israel. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Rick, you're up for your five minute closing. You're now start your time. You begin to speak. Yeah, this has been a very uh, lively discussion. I appreciate everyone for being a part of this, I, I think one of the fundamental things that we uh, heard uh, Stanley bring, brought up was a misunderstanding of the covenants. And uh, that is so, such an important thing. We're, we're not under the old covenant where that covenant has passed away. In fact, we, there's all kinds of language. Uh, he brought up Jeremiah 31, 31, and it said that uh, the, children of, uh, the children of Israel broke that covenant. And so that uh, God, Yahweh, was going to make a new covenant, unlike the one he made with his fathers. He did bring up the fact that this is going to be a new covenant with the house of 
Israel and the House of Judah. And Stanley, one of the issues that he, that rubbed him the wrong way, he's like, well, who, what, are you in Judah? Or are you in Israel? Well, all of that was ultimately fulfilled in Christ. That's the issue. We, these, all of these promises that I brought the verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, the promises of God are yes and amen and what and who and who in Christ Jesus. So uh, what did what did what did uh, Jesus say in Luke chapter 24 that the uh, law, the prophets and the writings are about who? When he was talking to those disciples that left Jerusalem on the way to Emmaus, it's about me. It's about Christ Jesus. Who is the true vine, the true vine that we are those who are saved, those who are redeemed? is Christ. He's the ultimate fulfillment of those promises. And so language like Isaiah 56 that talks about uh, the, 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 the stranger coming to the mountain, well, how is that ultimately fulfilled? He, he even referenced Christ. What the amazing thing is Stanley in his closing, he even referenced Christ and said that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you're not in covenant with Christ. That's salvific, my friend. If you're not in covenant with Christ, you're not saved. And so uh, his opening was all about this trying to make this distinction between saved people who are who have an inheritance versus saved people who don't have an inheritance. But what does the witness of Scripture say? What is when we look at all of Scripture in, in its totality, when you look at the language of inheritance, and that's a lot of what I was trying to bring out is when you try to make the argument that Sabbath keeping determines whether or not you inherit the kingdom of God, that is work salvation, my friend. And that's a false gospel now what we try to do try to make it, well it's a salvation issue it's a it's a sanctification issue uh but clearly what not we are saved by grace through faith not of works not of ourselves so no one will boast we're saved completely and totally by by god and notice stanley when i brought up all of the inheritance passages he said i didn't do to talk a lot about inheritance uh, he only really covered Amos 9, 11, and maybe some other passages about inheritance that dealt with some earthly possessions. But in Acts 15, was what was the Jerusalem Council concerned with earthly possession? No, they were concerned whether or not you were saved, whether or not you were in right relationship with God. That was the issue there. And what did Gentiles have to do to be in right relationship with God? The Judaizers said one thing. And then the council right, con rightly concluded what the word of God says, what the word of God has always said. The righteous though, shall live by faith, Habakkuk 2.4. We see that repeated where the very gospel presentation begins in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. That gospel that was presented first to the Jew and then to the Greek, right? That the righteous shall live by faith, the very way that one is saved in the old testament is the same way we're saved today right either looking forward to the promises of god or looking back at what was been fulfilled in the full uh, culmination and completion of those promises of god in the personal work of jesus what what was missing in this discussion unfortunately was christ my friend. where was christ in any of this it was a lot of uh you know this this kind of earthly inheritance business my friend what what first Peter chapter one, verse one and following says that we have reserved in heaven an inheritance that is undefiled, that's imperishable, and we're kept by the power of God through faith. That is what the apostles preached. So any teaching, here's here's the test to know where we got false teaching or true teaching. What did the apostles preach, my friend? Did they preach this idea of of uh Sabbath keeping in order to inherit the kingdom of God. And, and I want to say uh, kingdom of God, according to what we see, the, the, the normative usage uh, in the text of scripture, not some aberrant usage, but the normative usage that we see scripture. That is critical, my friend. And that's why this conversation is so important. I hope all of you were blessed. Have a good evening. All right, guys, Chris, thank you so much for those closing and what a great debate. You guys did great. Really appreciate the audience, really appreciate it as well. So now we are going to jump into these questions. I do have questions here and I have a super chat here from Jungle Jargon. And so it should pop up on the bottom of the screen here. Define an Israelite for me. That was a big part of the discussion uh, between Israel and Judah and such and such, such and such. Uh, so what is, how do you define an Israelite, Rick? What do you got? 
Well, the Israelite, there was a, like one of the things I mentioned, it depends on the context, right? So when we look at the Old Testament scriptures, we see the Israelite is referred to a, a, a covenant nation that was established at Mount Sinai with the giving of the law from Moses and the tablets of stone and all of the other laws that, and, and prescriptions that came from that. They, they were required to keep that. And there was the, the, the constant reminder that if you, if you did not do that, you would be cut off from, from among your people. And then we see the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 3, for example, this idea that we are the circumcision. Uh, that uh, uh, that idea that give no confidence to the flesh. When, and when he says we are the circumcision there, obviously he's not talking about the physical nation, but a spiritual Israel. I know some people debate that topic and say there's no such thing, but clearly there there's a distinction. So I like to make a distinction based on the context. All right, Stanley. Thank you. Uh, I didn't debate for Israelite. Um, Israelite is a physical descendant. I didn't debate for anything about a physical descendant. Um, you need to make a clear distinction a distinction between a native born, an Israelite, uh, and Israel, the spiritual seed. Psalms 87, Babylonians, Ethiopians, Egyptians are part of Israel, born from Zion. Zion, who is Zion? The son of God projecting his light within the parameters of the light is the city of God as per Psalms, uh, Isaiah 60, verse 14, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Jeremiah thirty three sixteen. He shall be called Yahweh our righteousness. The city itself will be called Yahweh our righteousness. So, uh, in, 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 in comparison to the Messiah, he is also called Yahweh our righteousness. So, uh, making the correlation between the city and the Son of God. So, um, I didn't hear come here to argue for Israelites. I'm not an Israelite. I'm Israel, part of the Commonwealth of Israel, the congregation of Israel, a stranger, part of the congregation of Israel. As per Exodus twelve verse. 18, 19, 48, and 49. I made that clear in my presentation. Is uh, Isaiah 14, verse 1, clearly says you will be incorporated inside of Israel. So if you're not Israel, then you're not really in covenant with Jesus Christ. Thank you. All right. Hey, let, let's try to keep the responses to the questions no more than one minute, guys. All right. Let's uh, keep it there. All right. So the next question is from Contemplate. He did send me a super chat, and I appreciate the support. Thank you so much for the support. This question is for Stanley. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 states that Israel was God's firstborn son. Later, Jesus was declared to be God's one and only son. Can Jesus be the only son if the firstborn isn't cast out? can jesus be the only begotten son when it says only begotten son is talking about being brought forth from eternity from the very bosom of the father which is has nothing to do with uh being uh the firstborn son israel being the firstborn son because that's being born from god i, I made it clear psalm 87 being born from god is receiving the holy spirit walking in the light of God. So um, once you're, I would refer you to Psalms 87, verse three, all the way down, you'll see what it means to be uh, a child of God. Uh, that has nothing to do with uh, John uh, John one eighteen being begotten from the bosom of the Father. That's, uh, you're trying to make a correlation with the two verses that have nothing uh, to do with each other. Thank you. All right, Rick. Yeah, so I, I think the individual is making reference to Galatians chapter uh, 4 verse 24 and following where it makes a distinction between the uh, the uh, Jerusalem below and the Jerusalem above and all those who are born of the spirit all of those who are in Christ are the, the, the Jerusalem above now in reference to the uh, uh, Exodus chapter 4 that reference is that and I brought this up a little bit in the debate and I'll, I'll say this quickly is that Jeruz uh, Israel was called the uh, God's son right firstborn right they were the t they would they typify what was ultimately fulfilled in Christ, just like Israel was called the vine. The true vine in John 15 was ultimately fulfilled in Christ. He sold everything that Israel was supposed to be. That's why I call him the consummate Israel. All right. And here is uh, another question here from Daily Reese. Thank you for the question. Did God stop working last Friday, last week Friday at sunset? If so, does the start over? If so, does the start over the Sabbath at sunset each time zone? If not, how is the day sacred to us but not to God? Because should I go first? 
Yeah, you go ahead, Stanley. Okay. All right. Um, God is not limited to time. He's outside of time. So I don't understand why you would even make this comment. Um, God is the one who came with the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's not subject to the Sabbath. So I don't understand why you would make this point. All right, Rick. Yeah, I'm reminded in, uh, I think it's Matthew 12, where Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. And he, he re I believe he responded, uh, the father's working and I'm also working. Uh, and they took that to mean, they knew that to mean that he was referring to deity there, uh, applying deity to himself. And so here's the thing. The scripture says that uh, the son upholds all things by the word of his power. Uh, that's the province of God in, in time working. So that's that first part of the question. Um, say a big no to that. And then so it follows, it does, so does the start of the Sabbath at sunset of each time zone. So I, I think the rest of it doesn't follow. Um, like I said, God's always working and through, through providence and, and his sovereignty. So that's all I will say about that. That's all comments I want to make about that question. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. question. This, this is your, for you, Rick. All right. Thank you for the question. Was it not the book of law ordinance that was placed on the side of the ark that was done away with and not the Ten Commandments that were placed inside the ark? Right. So we got to remember that another name for the Ten Commandments was the testimony. The testimony of what? The testimony of rebellion and sin against the children of Israel. And so when Galatians chapter four uh, says that um, he redeemed us uh, from the law, right? He redeemed, well, what law was he referring to? Obviously the law was only given to the children of Israel, but the, the children of Israel were a microcosm of the whole world. What the, what the law represented and how they respond to law would, would have been the same response that everybody would have made because the law, according to Romans 5.20, uh, doesn't make you better. It just reveals your sinfulness. Uh, it's not remediate. It doesn't remediate you. Uh, at least I know some people might disagree with that because some people have this idea of different purposes of the law. But its primary purpose was to show how sinful we are. So the point is, is that even the Ten Commandments was a testimony against mankind because it was called a testimony against rebellion and sin. In fact, the, the, I will add this. All you have to do is look at Second Corinthians chapter three where it calls the tablets what tablets are we talking about the ministry of condemnation that's in second corinthians chapter three in, uh, as opposed to the ministry of life uh referring to the gospel all right stanley thank you uh when it says uh, the ministry of the uh, on the tablets because it was outside of them so uh it's not referring to the the ministry of the tablets in our hearts jeremiah 31 31 so us trying to, because uh, 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 I've seen in the comments a lot of people saying that uh, this is work-based salvation. No, this is an empowerment for me to walk according to his will. There's a big difference. The glory belongs to him. He empowers his his uh, servants to walk according to his will. So uh, the ministry of death is only referring to the tablets outside of the physical tablets, not the, the law that's inscribed in our hearts. So if you're going to say the law of God is uh, the Ten Commandments are done away with, then you're gonna have a problem with uh, Deuteronomy 33 verse uh, verse three uh, verse two, and it says, "From his right hand, talking about the Son of God, came the fire you law." So it's part of the same essence, eternal. Psalms 119, 89, Revelation 11, 19, eternal. So for anyone to say that the, the Ten Commandments is done away with is very problematic. Thank you. Can I respond right. to that quickly? Because I mean, he brought that, something uh, in there that wasn't even part of it. <laughs> nah, no, re no responding, man. We're gonna keep it, nope. keep it, keep it. Okay, keep we it just keep it moving. No, but no, he, he just yeah, kind of keep it moving. there. Hey, I'll keep it. We can talk about I'm it later. Cool uh -huh. All mm -hmm. right, guys. Another question here, Sister Becky. Thank you for the question, Stanley. Why do you think it's so hard for people to know the difference between God's moral laws, the Ten Commandments, and the Levitical laws? Thank you, uh, Sister Becky. You're you're there with me. I made it clear in all my presentation the distinction between the law, the, the Ten Commandments, and the Ark of the Covenant, Deuteronomy five twenty two, Deuteronomy ten two, as opposed to the rest of the laws. It's not just the Levitical laws. Uh, Deuteronomy thirty one twenty six, circumcision. First Corinthians seven nineteen, circumcision is nothing. 
uh, or uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. But uh, this is something that people like to avoid. Um, why is that? Is I believe it's spiritual uh, because I don't I never I don't understand why people will be spiritually um, connected to Sunday worship as if they don't want to, to relinquish uh, relinquish that knowing very well it was not what uh, a part of uh, the customs of Jesus Christ or the apostles. So uh, I believe it's spiritual. All right, Rick, what you what you got? All right, I got a couple of responses from Scripture, Galatians 5, 3. For I testify again to every man that's circumcised. So we're talking about circumcision here, that he is debtor to the whole law. So the whole idea of this kind of separation between ceremonial, uh, civil, moral law distinction, that, that, that is a theological construct. Look, I come from, I, I come from the camp of, of uh, I would say, I've learned from the camp, rather, uh, covenant theologians and and that that is the common moniker right this tripartite distinction of law but guess what that's nowhere in the scriptures that is a theological construct placed over the scriptures and we've adopted that from thomas aquinas and other individuals but, but the, my challenge is this where is that found specifically in the text so that that's my response all right and here's a question for you stan uh, I think a lot of these questions are you for you, Stanley. It says, uh, what is the gospel? Pretty straightforward question. What you got, Stanley? Uh, yes. The gospel is the power of God to save uh, unto salvation. In other words, molding us into the image of his one and only begotten son. So if uh, he's molding us in the image of God, uh, his own, uh, only begotten son, then we should follow the same customs Jesus Christ did. So um, to somehow suggest that we could keep nine commandments, and well, his position was all over the place. Uh, we, we're not, we don't keep the covenant and then all of a sudden, oh, it's the ninth commandment. Are you, are you not, answering uh, the question, Stanley, or are you trying to? I am, I am, the, the gospel. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost done, I'm almost done, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation from what? From sin. So basically empowering us to walk according to his will. So the glory belongs to him. Don't say I'm a work-based sal uh, salvation. That's just you trying to circumvent or try, or try to avoid the, uh, the reality of my presentation. I said from the very beginning, the power of God unto salvation. So leading us unto his righteousness, Psalms 23, is very clear. The glory belongs to him. All right, Rick. All right, so the gospel is this, my friends, is that uh, we are, we are, mankind is a sinner. God is just, holy, and righteous. And we are not, and there's nothing we can do. Like uh, Luke chapter 18, what, how can man be saved, right? That was the question there. Trying to keep the law? No, no one can be saved by the law. That, that was the whole point Jesus was making. You can't be saved by keeping the law. The law only shows your sinfulness. You need a complete, utter reformation, and it has to be from the inside out. But we can't do it, but Christ did it. We have to repent and believe. And we put our faith and trust in him, repent of our sins, according to what uh, uh, Acts, I believe the end of Acts talked about, is that uh, preaching the, the idea of repentance, uh, the gospel of repentance and repenting of sins, that's Luke chapter 24, as well as other verses, that we will find our Lord Jesus Christ to be an all-sufficient Savior. He will save completely to the uttermost. That is the gospel in a nutshell. All right, and here is another question here. Thank you, Bible Care and Share Fellows. Thank you for the question. If we must keep the Sabbath, do we also not have to go up to Jerusalem three times a year as per Leviticus chapter 23? What do you say, Stanley? All right, um, people, uh, please try to pay attention to what I'm saying. There's a distinction between the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law. Deuteronomy 5. I, I'm giving you the references so that way you don't have to depend on men. Be a good Berean. Go verify the verses. Deuteronomy 5.22 Deuteronomy 10.2 as opposed to Deuteronomy 31.26 which is the rest of the law of Moses is a witness against us. So clear distinction and oh that's the Old Testament well that's the word of God but I go to Paul, 1 Corinthians 7, 19, 
my friend again tried to say there's no distinction between the law, but Paul says it. Circumcision and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. I asked him what the uh, keeping of the commandments of God is, and he didn't provide me uh, an appropriate response. But I'm doing this again for you. Please make the distinction between both. The eternal law, Psalms 119.89, the law that's in the uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which is in heaven, Revelation 11, uh, 11, 19. That is the Ten Commandments, the law that is put in our hearts as opposed to the rest, which is a witness against us. Please. All right, Rick, what you, what you got? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the text again. I think it's very clear. Notice what it says here in Galatians 5, 3. It says, for I testify against, uh, again, to every man that is circumcised. So we got... The, the, the ordinance to be circumcised here, that he's a debtor to do the whole law. Now, he's going to say, well, there's a distinction there. There's a distinction between the Ten Commandments and this other law here. And there, you don't see, you don't, I mean, obviously there's there's the physical distinction, but there but in, within the, the nation, there was not a logical distinction. And what, what Terry's trying to do is make a logical distinction. I've already answered Romans. Being the issue in Romans in context is clear. Just being circumcised and not obeying God is a fallacious endeavor. That's the point there. You have the law, but are you keeping the law? That's that's what it said there. Is it, it, Stanley going to bring that part up? It's not so. You you by the eighth day, every every male child had to be circumcised. So you're beyond that. Saying that you're saying that you are a uh, a child of Israel, and you're not following God, and you're boasting the fact that we've we've got the law, but you're not keeping the law. That's the point that's being made in that chapter. All yeah. right, all right. And here's a question for Rick. Mm -hmm. Passages such as John chapter fourteen verse fifteen and First John five chapter five verses one through five say, "To love God, you must keep His commandments. Can you inherit eternal life?" without loving God and thus keeping his commandments? Yeah. So one of the things I, I want to bring out is that it's not our obedience that's the basis of the of whether or not we inherit the kingdom of God. It's our obedience that demonstrates that we are the inheritors of the kingdom of God. So I, you see, that, see what I did there? I made a distinction. The basis, and I brought this up in my presentation, the basis for our inheritance of the kingdom of God is the triune God himself. What he purposed, what he willed, and what he accomplished through the person of Jesus Christ. And the dwelling of the Holy Spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the point. So when it comes to, I mean, yeah, what, what, what Christ did and what we could not do, according to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, it, Christ fulfilled that so that we would fulfill the terms of the law. So it goes back to what Christ did so that we would be the people of God that God desired. It's holy and blameless, the church, right? Present that bride, ultimately, that you see in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and following. That was God's plan there. So, yeah, the people of God are people who love God and love his people. Clearly, the epistle of John makes that clear. But they only do that because of what God has brought in them. All right, Stanley? Thank, thank you. I don't know who said this question, but notice how you didn't address the part to, to love. Can you love God uh, 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 and and not keep his commandments and still inherit eternal life? He didn't address that. He gave a nice story, but he didn't really address. Can you inherit the kingdom, love God without keeping the commandments? He didn't address the keeping the commandments. I say the same thing as him. Every All the glory belongs to Jesus. The difference between me and him, when I read Psalm 23, lead us into righteousness. He's saying, don't do anything, or he's talking about a law of Christ, which he can't define. I don't even know what the law of Christ, according to him, because the law of Christ is not everything in Scripture when God spoke. So there's a distinction between the Old Testament and New Testament. The Jesus in the Old Testament is different from the the Son of God. In the, the Son of God in the Old Testament is a different Son of God in the New Testament, whatever that means. But the fact still remains, he did not address keeping the commandments. Can you love God? Uh, can, can you not keep the commandments? And love God still and still inherit the kingdom. Of course not. You, you, you cannot. And First John makes that clear. First John 2. If you're walking in the light, prove that you're walking in the light by keeping his commandments. So uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, so, somebody's paying attention. 
All right. And this will be our final question of the night. What's up, MJ? What's going on with your buddy? How you doing, man? All right. So we got a question for Stanley. May, uh, Stanley made much of a big deal about the Ten Commandments being eternal in heaven. How does he explain that the Sabbath command comes to be based on God's act of creation? Question to made a big deal about the Ten Commandments being eternal in heaven. Yes. How does that if he explain that the Sabbath command comes to be based on God's act of creation because he's in heaven, eternality, Isaiah 57, 15. He projects the light. A fiery law, a fiery law came out of his hand, an eternal law. And it comes to us. The law is for us, not for him. So obviously it has to come in and be applied in time and space, which is creation and everything in it. I, I don't understand the question. And it's not really, okay, I don't understand the question. Maybe I, I, I don't understand what you're saying. All right, uh, Rick. Well, first of all, I don't believe Sabbath is a creation command to begin with you. If you look at Genesis, uh, there's not a mandate. Adam was not given a mandate to uh, keep the Sabbath. That was something you see, obviously, in Exodus, where that was presented. That, that's been my whole presentation, is that you see that in Exodus. Uh, which is the reason is that if, if, if nobody was keeping the Sabbath, or if no one was commanded, rather, until you get to Exodus, then how can all of the Ten Commandments be the eternal moral law of God? See, we got a problem there, you know, that we that that we haven't quite addressed uh, that that shows a kink in the armor there. Um, and I know that many believe. Now, here's the thing. I know many believe that the Ten Commandments and I know even some of my uh, covenant theolog theology friends. Right. will say, hey, the Ten Commandments are the eternal moral law of God. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. I believe here's my stance that every covenant we have covenants as God's expression of his law. And because God is the same today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, he's the same God. Things like murder are always going to be wrong. Things like lying are always going to be wrong. And you see, that's what, so when Stanley, earlier, I have to get my, I have to get mine in, man. When Stanley said, hey, he's got confused about either you keep the Ten Commandments or you're not. What I was referring to is the similar laws between the old covenant and new covenant, except for one, and that's the Sabbath. We have all, we have nine of the ten except for one. Now the Sabbatarian will try to say, well, we have to keep all ten. That's the the position that Stanley falls in. But he he clearly doesn't see. There's clearly no uh, mandate in the New Testament scriptures that says that Christians. That's what we're talking about here. Christians have to keep the Sabbath. And that was the issue that was never addressed. All right. All right, guys, good stuff. Appreciate both of you. Uh, once again, this was a fantastic debate and I I knew it was going to be a good one and because I knew who I had in the ring. So thank you so much, guys, for joining me this on this episode of Gospel Truth. And I'm sure that many people were blessed. And, you know, one thing I always tell everyone, that uh, there's one thing you take away from debates. You know, your positions may not have altered or changed, but there's one thing you do take away and that's understanding your, per, your interlocutor's positions and what they hold to so that you could properly deal with them you know to make you make you better at dealing with these arguments so uh, that said i'm gonna let you guys go man you guys have any uh, closing words before i uh, let you go uh thank you very much for your hospitality uh especially given in light of the fact that you know my position uh, i know this is not a popular position but this is something that needs to be said um i'm doing this uh, uh to the glory of uh jesus christ uh, and I believe this is the truth. And uh, if I didn't share it, I, I'll be judged uh, uh, in, according to that. So uh, I did my part. I laid my cards on the table to know, so everybody can know what we're dealing with. And thank you again for the hospitality and uh, platforming me. And uh, hopefully we do this again in the future. Thank you for Rick for accepting the debate. Because a lot of people don't want to debate me because they understand. But at least you were able to come in the ring and uh, challenge uh, my position. Thank you very much. Good evening to everybody and happy Sabbath. Right. All right. Well, first of all, I thank all of, you know, thank you, uh, Marlon, for just extending the invitation. I appreciate you, Stanley, for just the, uh, the civil discussion. We can, we can do a debate in a civil fashion. And so I, I think this one, as far as the decorum 
was even much better than our first debate. I, I think you would agree with that, Stanley. Uh, so uh, there's always areas for improvement for all of us, including myself. And so, uh, look, you don't have a debate unless people disagree, right? So everybody knows that uh, coming to this debate that I, I wasn't on Stanley's side of the of the ledger. But the thing is, we we can intelligently, civilly make our case from scripture uh, and leave this uh, knowing that we we put our level best cases known before the operator. So I think for both of us, job well done. Yeah, I agree. I agree, guys. Mm. All right. So I will be in contact with you guys, man. You never know. May want you guys to jump back on at some point in time. But uh, to, to that, uh, I'm going to let you guys go. And you guys take care. And God bless. All right? All right. All right. Another good one. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, the, you know, and that's, it, this is what I appreciate about doing all this, right? Like uh, I piggyback on what Rick said, you know, even though they disagree, you know, there's no big secret here, right? Two guys get <laughs> having a debate. They disagree on the subject matter, right? So there's no big secret. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of people are like, oh man, I don't want to offend. I don't want to, I don't want to be rude. It's not about that. It's not about offending. It's not about being rude. What it's about is being able to, to, to discuss these things in a manner that's going to uh, 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 encourage good discussion. You know what I mean? And that's that's what it's about, man. Um, and, that's what, and that's what I appreciate about uh, Mr. Rick and Mr. Stanley is that they were able to jump into a ring in a, in a, with a very difficult topic matter and in many ways controversial topic matter and be able to discuss it, you know? Because this is a gospel issue right here. This topic is a gospel issue. And so um, it's, it's vitally important that as being a gospel issue, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's discussed in a manner for both parties to be able to hear and understand what is being said. And I think that both of these guys did that. They did it very well. And I pray out there uh, in the live chat and anyone who else is going to be watching after this live uh, live stream is complete. I pray that you uh, 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 understood what was being said. And uh, if this is one of those areas, one of those gray areas for you uh, and, that, and that you had a hard time understanding, perhaps this debate uh, helped you understand it. And so, um, once again, I do thank Stanley and I do thank Rick for uh, coming on and taking time away from their families or whatever they can be doing uh, and coming on a gospel truth. And I do thank you as the audience for coming on and spending time with us on this episode of the gospel truth. But as always, make sure you hit the subscribe before you leave. Make sure you hit the subscribe and that notification bell so you don't miss out on any debates. Uh, if you were here early at the beginning, I went over several debates that are coming up here soon. So you don't want to miss out on any of those and the ones that are coming up after those debates. So make sure you hit the subscribe and that notification bell so you can stay in the loop of everything that's going on. Um, and if you don't know, we have quickly, we have a live in person debate coming up in September 24th in Arizona, Mesa, Arizona. So if you're in an area around Mesa, Arizona at 6 p.m. Uh, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, make sure you go by and check out the debate. All right. All right. So that said, I'm going to let you guys go. May God bless you and may God keep you. See you later. Bye.